Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Amen. You know, God is absolutely holy and set apart and so far separated from what we are, but through Jesus Christ, we have absolute, complete access to him. And uh, so we're going to pray tonight. And uh, God hears and answers the prayers of his people. He really does. Let's pray with confidence tonight. Let's believe God for uh, this conference coming up. We want to believe God for our pioneer works as well, stateside, overseas. And as they're going to be traveling, uh, many of those will be traveling in to come to the conference. We want to pray for them for that. We want to pray for folks for salvation tonight, praying for Isaac, Landon, Brian, and Rodney Ivan. Also for Jess and Randy. I want to pray for Jimmy, Bell, um, the Hill Hall and the Rivera families, as well as Caitlin, Kelly, Dominic, Denia, David, Addy, and Reuben for salvation. Uh, some special requests, praying for backsliders to come home and also for, uh, to be able to break addictions. Amen. I want to pray for healing tonight for Ethan Price, Josh, uh, Reuben. Judy and AJ for healing. So let's uh, let's lift our hearts and voices tonight. I want to pray and want to ask if our brother C. Ray would open us up in prayer this evening. Let's pray, church. Father, we thank you and we come by the blood of Jesus. God, we have no confidence in our flesh. Lord, we trust in you in all things, God. We're asking that you show us the right and good way. Lord, in everything, help your people, Lord God. We live. God, we're asking that you move. God, we so thank you for the privilege, God, it is to be in your house and in your presence, God. God, we pray for an outpouring of your spirit in this place, God. God, that you would touch every need, God, every place, God. God, there would be breakthroughs in lives and in hearts tonight, God. God, that the souls would be saved, God, souls would be t- the backslider redeemed and restored, God. God, supernatural miracles, God. God, God, be in our upcoming conference, God. Use it, God, to stir hearts, God. God, use it to refresh your people, God. God, we pray, God, for our missionaries, our pioneer works, God. God, we pray your anointing and grace upon this service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Greet one another. Welcome somebody out to church tonight. Welcome to the Door Christian Fellowship Church. Glad you decided to join us today. Before we get into the preaching of the word, we have a few announcements we'd like to share with you. But before we get into the announcements, let me show you where you can find all this information. We have our church app here. Just click on it, tap on the weekly calendar, and here you can see a schedule of all our events. And for those that prefer a paper calendar, you can pick one up at the front door, and we have all of our list of events, as well as the events coming up in the months to follow. On Sundays, we have Sunday school starting at 9.30 in the morning for ages three and up. On Sunday morning at 10.30, we have our morning service. We also have our service at 6.30 p.m., which is also a different message than the morning service. We also have children's church for children ages three all the way up to the sixth grade at 6.30 p.m. Every single day of the week, we have morning prayer starting at 5 a.m. all the way till 10 a.m. So join us for that before you get your day started so you can lay a hold of God. On Tuesday at 7 p.m. here at the church, we have our Difference 180 class. That class is centered around folks that are trying to overcome addiction, depression, or various other things. Come join us for that. On Wednesday night, we have our midweek service at 7 p.m. The building's open at 6 p.m. for prayer, so come pray before service. On Thursday, se habla español, Tenemos estudio bíblico a las 7 aquí en la iglesia. 
Friday, we have Mommy and Me for the moms and children for ages five and under. Come out at 1030 and be a part of that. Saturday, we have our local outreach here at the church at 3 p.m. with various out-of-town outreaches for some of our neighboring churches. You can check the calendar to find out when the next outreach is taking place and where it's going and sign up on our app, of course. Saturday night at 7.30 p.m., come join us for our City Light Cafe where we have live bands and drama skits every single week. Check out our church app to follow along in the Bible reading plan. Amen. Just a couple other announcements. Uh, just real quick, um, for you guys in the back, it looks like the live stream is not functioning, they say. So if we could look into that. We do have a couple other announcements um, this uh, evening. Uh, we're going to be, as we know, or mentioned a couple of times earlier, we're going to begin our conference fast uh, tonight at midnight. Um, if you do not have a, uh, actually, so we're going to have a special code for the door. Uh, for the entry code, um, if you're going to come and pray uh, during the night especially or um, if your code does not work uh, 24 hours a day, please see Pastor King. Uh, we've got a special code that is uh, that will work uh, 24 hours a day during this conference. So um, if you would, uh, if you're in, if you're going to be praying, come in the building and, and praying uh, and you need that code, please speak to Pastor King. Um on Sue, let's see, hold on, let me go through the week in order if we can. We need, uh, we do still need some help with Children's Church, please speak to Joe Serrero about that. Um, and then, there's not going to be any City Lights this, this Saturday or next Saturday, uh, won't be resuming until the 30th, I think it is, is that right, C. Ray? Yeah, until the 30th. And then, uh, br Bridal Shower is going to be for Nancy Olivares on uh, Thursday. Yeah. Amen. She said they're feeling a lot better. They're here tonight. And so that's going to be 7 p.m. right here at the church building. And then we're going to, okay, uh, we've got, okay, Saturday got a cleanup. Uh, if we could get all hands to help us out to get kind of a, uh, a good overall just kind of cleaning up, touching up on, on uh, getting everything straightened around. Uh, Sister Mary has been doing a great job of keeping this place uh, clean and in order. Amen. Um, but we want to, amen, we want to do just a quick uh, before pre-conference cleanup this in the morning on Saturday. That'll be about maybe 8, eight to 10 and just take care of a couple of last minute things to get everything in order so that conference can be uh, nice and clean and smooth uh, starting out. Okay. Now mentioned conference is going to be the 18th through 22nd. That's going to be followed by the Difference 180 run, and uh, Kevin said that they're looking for volunteers to help on the day of the race. You can sign up to help out with that in the foyer. You don't have to run if you sign up for this, okay? So uh, I said, well, maybe I'll think about helping out then. No. Um, and then uh, he's, he also said that there's yard signs available you can take and, and set out in your yard. As we mentioned before, a Sunday morning, going to be, be uh, beginning revival services with John Perry, uh, missionary from Australia, and yeah, wonderful, uh, wonderful things coming. On the 30th, we're sending an impact team to Raleigh for Stephen Herring. I'm sorry, let me back up one. The 16th, we're also going to send an impact team to High Point for Pastor Avery McBurney. If you can go to that, please sign up. I see we do have a couple folks signed up for that. And then, uh, uh, then the 30th is our last impact team for this month, going right, to, right over the, to Raleigh, North Carolina, for Pastor Stephen Herring. All right, that's all we've got for announcements for right now. We're going to give an offering tonight. Let's give God praise as the ushers come. Father, we thank you, Jesus. We bless your name. We give you praise and glory, Lord God. Wonderful, faithful Savior. Amen. Amen. We're going to give. Just want to ask if uh, Brother John Folker would bless the offering tonight.
I hope you've been with Jesus all day. I remember as a new convert singing that song and just laughing, thinking this is incredible. I have been with Jesus all day. Amen. It's a wonderful thing to be saved. And you can walk with him every day. Thank you, singers, musicians. I want you all to open to Proverbs chapter 3 tonight. We'll be reading there in a moment. I'm glad you're with us. I was, uh, I'm preaching a sermon I call Several Great Keys uh, That You Get in Life from Wisdom. And, uh, you know, keys are important. I had a friend and uh, when we were young men, he's a young guy. I mean, and I've also, I remember one young man I knew from high school carried keys outside. You know, some of you guys will do that. It's okay to have your keys on a, a chain, you know, outside. But I've seen this guy, he must have had 20-some keys on there. And I thought, he doesn't even have a car. And I doubt if his parents even give him a key to the house. Amen. And he walks with a limp because he's hanging five pounds of keys there. And, you know, keys are very important if you need them. Amen. And if they unlock something, but just you know, to have them and be of no use, why have them? Right? And so wisdom unlocks some things for God's people that only his wisdom can do. So I want to just encourage you in the word tonight, and I want you to read a few verses with me in Proverbs chapter 3, beginning verse 21 through 26 is what we'll read. And the scripture is speaking of the issue of wisdom and getting understanding, you know, and cherishing that and taking it in. And it says, my son, do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep sound wisdom. And discretion, so they will be life to your soul and grace to your neck. Then you will walk safely in your way, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, when you lie down, and, and your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden terror, nor trouble from the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence, and will keep your foot from being caught. I want to declare tonight, wisdom holds the keys to several very important issues in life, coverings, if you will, that will guide you, protect you, take care of you, keep you in good stead. And number one it, with a uh, thing to do with this, I think, tonight is the guidance of God. Amen. It is wise to believe God, and it's even more wise after you've believed and surrendered to God to begin to let him guide your life. How many of you heard the term, the will of God? It's a, it's, a, it's a common phrase amongst Bible-believing and Bible-reading Christians. Not all Christians in the world have uh, any clue what that is. I remember the first time speaking to one of my dear, close relatives when I was a young convert, and uh, he, was, he was wondering why I won't do what he's doing. He set up a, a, an event, you know, a party night, you know, and I drove all the way down to the Phoenix Valley to visit him, from the mountains I lived in, you know, trekked down there a couple hours. And this was my sole mission, was to go see him on the Friday night I had free and visit him and witness and share his testimony. I've already preached to him. He knows what's happened to me. I've been saved. But when I, I went to do this, he, he, he knows what I'm coming for. He knows what I'm preaching. He's a very religious guy, but he's just kind of touching some things up around the house. I'm following him around. I'm talking to him. Talking to him, talking to him, and then uh, he's getting his shoes. He ties his last shoelace. He looks up and he says, you ready? I said, I, I am. I'm here. I'm going to spend the evening. You know, he said, no, 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 you and me are going out. He had plans. He had a bag of cocaine. He had parties to go to, places to get, things to do, women, everything. I said, good grief, you're a married man. Yeah, but it's Friday night, you know, it's cool. And I remember making a few statements and saying some things. I don't remember what all it was, but I remember when I came to the part of, listen, I have found there's something better in life. And I can't live like I used to because I don't want to miss the will of God. And I remember him turning around because he was going towards the front door when I used the terminology, the will of God. This is a religious man, very, very steeped in catechism, religious, Catholic faith, and he turns around and looks at me and goes, will of God, where did you get that? I, I, well, listen, God has a will, certain desires and purpose for every soul that's ever breathed there. And here's the typical religious mentality. What the heck is the will of God? Where does that come from? Well, I want to know which way does God want to take me through life? How about you? 
that we end up where he wants us to be in the end. That's important. Amen. And I want to tell you, he is the best guide and compass you can have. Amen. You may not see everything you want to see with your eyes and understand everything you want to understand with your brain, but if you'll walk by faith and trust God, he is the best compass you can ever get. He will get you through this life like nothing else can. I'm thinking as I'm preparing this sermon, I'm, I'm thinking of Abraham and and I'm thinking of when he's faced with a big choice. You know, he's got his nephew Lot with him. They're both growing with their herds and their, their team and their laborers, their servants, their, every, their enterprise. They're prospering. They're growing. The herds are getting huge. There's not enough water and enough food, uh, food grazed for the animals where they're staying. And so they talk to each other and decide, you know what? We got to split up so we can have enough land for my herd and your herd. And so Abraham says to the nephew, he says, what, what do you want to do? And the Bible says Lot clearly lifted his eyes and he looked on the plains of Sodom. This is fertile ground. Fertile ground is important, folks. It's really important. I, I preach all over the world. I travel a lot of places. I see what looks to be really fertile and green places and stuff, but you find out that you can't grow vegetables on it or it won't grow fruit trees. and It's just not conducive. The soil, some kind of alkali or some kind of issue. How many of you know just because it's dirt, it doesn't mean it'll grow everything? So I see this and I realize, you know, that land where Abraham and Lot were standing at that time it was barren wilderness everywhere you look but one direction. Now, Lot didn't say, why don't we try to work out something down here where there's a lot of food for our animals and there's water and good soil and everything we need. Why don't we try to do this? He says, I'll take that. Now, Abraham had the wherewithal to say, okay, my life is in God's hands. Lot chose the world for the direction he would go. And if you know the story, Lot's life ended in absolute chaos. Just to shorten it up. He chose what appealed to his carn carnality, his senses. He chose the world for this. He chose a better life now. He chose prosperity, all these things. You know, he had an appetite that he saw that and he said, that's what will quench my appetite. Abraham chooses the Lord for his direction. Abraham's walk of faith was a relationship to God in obedience to God. You know, I don't think Abraham said, oh, you want the plains of Sodom, huh? Well, I know what's behind these mountains you don't want. Abraham knew this was wilderness desert. He said, it's okay. I'm walking with God. I can take this and I can handle it. When we find Abraham, I mentioned him once or twice this morning, but when he first got called by God, his calling was just simply to get up. And where are we going? He's, God says to him, I'll show you as you go. And it's faith. You walk by faith. That's, you say, man, is that, that's guidance? Yes, that's guidance. And that's what we need. Our obedience will open the road for guidance from God. And we find Abraham years down the road, rescuing Lot from Sodom. And when he rescues Lot, he is offered a great reward. He's offered, the king of Sodom offers to give him a fortune, man, to give him all kinds of things. He says, no, 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 God's my reward. I'm just shortening this up, but here's the story. God calls him to offer his only son, Isaac, to offer him up like the heathen people are doing, you know, cut his throat, bleed him out on an altar, set it on fire, offer it to God. And Abraham goes all the way till God provides the ram for him. And he even tells his son when they're going up the mountain and the boy says, look, Dad, here's me, you, fire, wood. Where is the sacrifice? And God speak, Abraham speaks about his faith in God and says, God will provide himself a ram for this sacrifice. And he did. And now in the story I'm talking about is where the Lord says to Abraham, after Lot separated from him, they made this choice. Abraham said, fine, you can have that. I have another choice. And the Bible says after Lot departed, that God spoke to Abraham in Genesis 13, 14 and said, lift up your eyes now, look, Abraham, 
from the place where you are, look northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land which you see I will give to your descendants and you forever. I'll make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. God is telling him, you have just chosen an eternal inheritance. It's far bigger than Lot looked at. He looked at a piece of ground. He looked at that right there to satisfy his immediate needs and to make his life a juicy right now and give him everything he needed. He looked right there, but God told Abraham, now look all the way as far as you can see, north, south, east, west. He says, you see, what, what you see, that is your inheritance. Plus, I'll make your offspring like the dust of the earth. That means a great multitude. And you know today, you and I, if, if you got saved one minute ago or this morning or yesterday, or the people that are getting saved even now on the or today, this moment, they're part of that inheritance. That's the blessing of Abraham. God brought that to be, just like he said, you know, and he, he had the wisdom to understand God will direct his path. He'll direct ours if we let him. He'll direct our paths if we obey him. Jesus put it very clearly in the book of Luke. He said, to, he said this, I'm paraphrasing, but I'll read you some scripture in a moment. He said, you know, the storms of life are going to fall. The wind is going to blow. The rain is going to fall. The water is going to rise. He said, you will be wise to build your life on my word. He said this in Luke 6, Jesus did in verse 46. But why do you call me Lord and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I'll show you who he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. So when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently against the house, it could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation. When the stream beat against it vehemently, immediately it fell, and the room of that house was great. This is like so many people in our world today who profess faith in God, but they're not digging and building a foundation. They're not building on the word of God. They don't have the word to anchor them and guide them. It's essential that we do this. You know the scripture in James. Many people know verse 22 of chapter 1. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. And it's just a common scripture. It's just a very applicable scripture in all kinds of places in life. But surely when it comes to the word of God, we should not just say, yeah, yeah, we know it. We've heard it. We've done that, been there. Done. No, no, do it. It's like building, building something that's going to stand when life hands you bad times, when the storms fall and the wind blows and the rain pours. Your house, your life, your home, your personage must stand. Now, a lot of times we'll, I'll preach out of that text and use that many preachers will but you know we'll tag right on there the next verse so verse 22 says be a doer of the word and not a hearer only deceiving yourself for if anyone hears the word and is not a doer he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror he looks at himself he goes away and immediately forgets what he was like but the one who looks in the perfect law the law of liberty and perseveres being not just a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. He will be a blessing and be blessed in all he does. So it's essential that wisdom, if it's going to be yours, where does it come from? It's got to come from God. You have to be able to hear when you read his word, when you hear preaching, when you're prayer, in prayer. You have to be able to hear. But then you have to obey. And that obedience can sometimes be like work. Trust, trusting God just as Abraham did when he could see. He could see as well as Lot. He knew this is a great place for our cattle. This is a great place to build an enterprise of some sort. But he looked the other ways and it was just wilderness as far as he could see. But God said, there's more than wilderness there. There's destiny. Trust me. James writes and says, don't just say you hear it, 
do it. But what we ought to do is back up a couple verses. Although verse 22 says, be a doer of the word, not only a hearer. Verse 19 says, know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Put away all filthiness, rampant wickedness, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls and be a doer of the word. I find it fascinating that God speaks this way when he's talking about us being able to hear his word. He says, if you're going to be able to hear him, he says, listen, be quick to hear. Quick means have living ears. You can hear it. You hear what he's saying. You can respond to what he has to say you, and, and be slow to speak. In other words, this is one of the big problems we have is we're quick to speak and drown out what we don't want hearing. Don't want to hear. It's human nature. I've had people ask me for counsel and said before, I can't speak. I've spent 30 minutes with them. I didn't get to say a full sentence. They didn't want to hear a preacher's answer. They just wanted to vent or something, you know. And the Bible says, my beloved brothers, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Because angry people say wrong things. Angry, can you say amen? None of us did, but we've heard them do it. Amen. <laughs> angry people just, and then, boy, I wish I didn't say that. Well, I said it. I'll twist it a little, turn it, make it sound like, like it's an angry person. And God says, you have ears that can hear and respond. And sometimes zip it up. <laughs> and just let it wait. You have to be able to hear to receive wisdom. Because wisdom didn't just come from inside, did it? You said, well, I went to high school. Okay, <laughs> a lot of people did. Got multiple degrees. Got a PhD, piled high and deep. It's just a good one, you know. It, you, you may have some great credentials for things, but wisdom we're talking about is how to live life, how to find the will of God. Be able to hear and not just close up, not just speak out to drown out what you don't like God's direction saying. Maybe God's challenging you to humility. Has he ever done that? Yes. Yes. Does he challenge you to correct yourself? Does he challenge you to be humble? Does he challenge you to take a different path? Yep. Does he challenge you to do things you don't want to do? Yes, God does. And if you're going to drown him out by speaking, mumbling under your breath, you'll not get the sound advice that God wants to give you. Be quick to hear. Slow to speak, slow to anger. This is why when the wife says, why don't you talk to pastor? <laughs> I ain't know what he'll say. What do you think about that? He's going to say, no, he's quick to speak out and drown it out. Well, what do you think he's going to say? What is it? He's going to say this. Well, you think that's good advice? Well, I don't want to talk to him. It could be good advice. It's just I'm not going to do it. Being a hearer and not a doer, the Bible says it's a foolish way to go. And Jesus even said, he says, dig down the truth, bare rock, man. Get all this stuff out of the way. You're building your house, your life, your foundation that you want to stand through all the storms of life. It's already been through a storm. The next one will come. Hang on. God puts a foundation there. If, you, if you'll dig to it and get there, and then you'll begin to build on it, it'll, you'll do well. Isaiah 28, 16, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act foolishly or hastily. God says, I'm putting a foundation there for you. You can build on it. But where is it? You've got to dig down. You've got to open your ears. You've got to work a little. You've got to change some opinions and some thoughts. I love the message version. For, I, I read that a lot parallel sometimes when I'm reading, and I thought in this particular text, it says this, the same verses there say, but the master God has something to say 
uh, uh, something to say to this. Watch closely. I'm laying a foundation in Zion. That's in his house, his church, his people. A solid granite foundation, squared and true. And this is the meaning of the stone. A trusting life won't topple. I'll make justice the measuring stick and righteousness the plumb line for the building. A hailstorm will knock down the shanty town of lies and a flash flood will wash out the rubble. But you got a foundation if you're building on Christ. If you have the wisdom to adhere to truth and anchor yourself, because the storms in life are going to come. Your life, it's not just a conglomeration of random acts and things happening. Man, get to know that God has a purpose for you, a plan, a destiny. And you are building, whether you think so or not, whether you think it's not important, you know, what you do and how you live. You just want to come out on top or something. It's, you need to be cautious here. 1 Corinthians 3 in verse 12 says, if any man builds on the foundation, which is Christ, our chief cornerstone, and you will build, you'll build something. He says that you build with gold, silver, precious stones. I, I know you're building a beautiful place. Or you build with wood, hay, straw, or stubble, one King James calls it. Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which is built on remains, he'll receive a reward. The Bible says that you and I literally how many of you use the term, you know, my house, my household, you know, you're young, you're getting married, you start a house. Well, it's not a building, it's your lives. It's your destiny. It's who you are becoming, what you're going to be in life, what your family is going to become. And the Bible says, yep, we're building. What are we building with? Wisdom will build with good stuff. It'll put down a foundation. And God has purpose for you that you can achieve I, I love when he's preparing I just read a bunch of Exodus this week while I was away but I, I read where a couple of fellows he's talking to Moses you know they're going to build this tabernacle and build the, the altar and build this intricate gold and, and, and work and woodwork and he says this in Exodus 36 1 then wrought Bezalel and Ahilab and every wise-hearted man in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know the work and all manner of work for the service of this project. They were wise-hearted. They had wisdom, the scripture says in the next verse. And God had put it in them so they could build. So whatever God has for you is doable. Your destiny is completely within reach. As life is growing longer for me and shorter, I'm getting older, I seem to be able to see so much more clearly what I couldn't see before. It's amazing. More keenly aware. You should be more keenly aware of life as you age. Let me just put it that way. And if you're not, talk to me after church. I mean, we'll try to help you with that one. Amen. But uh, you should be wising up. You're getting older in life. You should know what's important. You should be able to see it better and better. And I'll tell you, it's important that you learn how to hear God and do like James says, then do the word. And do like Jesus said, if you say you're hearing him, get out and dig. Build down to this, go down to solid rock, bedrock, and build. Because you'll have some fruit when you do this. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. It'll lead you into an eternal place. And you know what this will do? This will bring you confidence. So wisdom will guide you. Wisdom will give you confidence. Amen. I, I'll tell you, I, I heard, I think of Pastor Warner say it 30 some years ago, 40 years ago, you know, that, you know, he, he believes for things way greater than himself because God's his God. I probably don't have that as an exact quote, but I thought, I remember hearing those words in that fashion. And I tell you, I, I wrote them down, my notes that day. I said, man, I think that's one of the big problems I have is I, don't, I, I, I take God out of his position. He's big. He wants to do bigger things than we are or we think we have faith for. 
And the Lord, our verse 3, verse 26 says, the Lord will be your confidence. That's what we, so the writer is saying there, he's saying, man, lay hold of wisdom. Get it. Get some, get some understanding. Keep these things. Guard them. Hold them to your heart. And if you do, then God will be your confidence. I'm telling you, there's some times in life, faith will put you in a place where the only thing you have is confidence God is going to make it work. So it's a good place to be. It's okay. But you got to keep your confidence in God, and he'll give it to you. Because we are building. We're building. You know, I have some experience with building. I, I worked uh, building uh, for many years, 20 years before I went into the ministry full-time, doing cement work and structures, everything from cabins and houses to motels and, and condos and biz, motel, whatever, businesses. We built and built and built. I was busy all the time working building. I learned some things. I learned some things about engineering, design, different things, not massive projects, you know, but on my level. And, you know, in 1999, we built a house on Oak Drive. Many of you remember that. You've seen that. And you go down in the little gully, the little hollow down there by the swamp, and, you know, you go down and up. That's it. It just, you know. And so I remember Carlos Morales was a young uh, realtor. He just got out of the Marine Corps. And so, you know, he's, he, Carlos could sell you your own shoes. He's a good salesman. Amen. And uh, I, I thought, I better drag him down to that property and see what he thinks. You know, I, I could see something being built. But it's just, whoosh, and there's a little creek running there. And, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I want to build a house. So I bring Carlos down there. And we went after, after the hurricane in 99. And these trees were down. It's like a jungle, man. And I had a machete, and I'm swack, you know, just smacking some of the stuff out of the way and hiking on in, and I'm talking, and I'm talking. And I say something, I say, I say it again. I turn around, I look. He didn't even come down. He's way up the hill. I said, Carlos. He goes, yeah, what, what, what exactly do you want to do here? I said, I want to buy it and build a house here. He goes, why? I said, because it's a cheap piece of dirt, for one thing. I can afford it. I said, secondly, it's, it's kind of secluded down here. He says, yeah, it's a gully. Where are you going to put a house? I said, well, come on. I dragged him down. And I showed him the one spot that was big enough to set a house, run the septic system out, and have just a 90-foot leach field, proper distance from the creek, and make it work without a foot to move either which way. I measured it out a few times. And so I got him down there, and he's going, I don't know, Pastor. I don't know. You know, he saw it later when we built it. It was a nice place. But we had to, we were by a little creek that was usually just a little creek unless we had a hurricane, which we had sometimes. And I built this. Now, my wife, God love my wife. She's not in here. I can say this. She's a bit of a worry wart about things like me building her house. Amen. And building it so close to the creek. I said, honey, is that creek you can jump across it most places? But, you know, Floyd came, Hurricane Floyd. Remember that one? Three feet of rain in Onslow County. Some places more. I think my house got eight feet. Amen. <laughs> so the power goes out, but we still have cell service. And the second night when the bands were coming, remember the rain bands would come through? And you'd be, you'd be sprinkling. Say, hey, it's dying down. And all of a sudden, whoosh, there's six more inches in, in an hour. And then you look on your phone, and you can see it. Oh, my gosh, there's another, there it is, no, another bang. Well, that night, I heard this noise. My wife's in a panic. So we're sleeping downstairs by the office, and the, the water's <laughs> rising out there. And uh, we're just, it's better down there, you know. It's, the walls are stronger, there's cement, and the trees come down, it's fine. So we're just down there, but we're not really sleeping. We're not, she's sleeping, but I hear this noise. <laughs> what it was was the little spillway I made in the creek had maxed out. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. I got a five-foot culvert. That's this tall. Well, that's probably this tall. I'm not sure. It's this tall. Five foot. I used to be 5'8", okay? I'm shrinking. I said, a five-foot culvert. And I know that sound. That's water filling it. And all of a sudden, it sucks a big gulp of air. I sneak out of the bedroll. Where I live, and I go over into the little pantry room. And I sit down. And I put my phone on. And I'm sitting there in the dark, and all of a sudden I hear her go, what are you looking at? <laughs> and I showed her, I says, there's an endless line of these bands still coming. And she goes, ah! I said, God, relax. You know, I said, 
Worst case scenario, we can launch a canoe out the door. Amen. It's, you know, that close. It's, it's water is rising. It's, but I knew. I was confident. I just was checking the weather report. Amen. But I was confident because I knew how I built the house. It wasn't going to wash out where it was. We, it was work to put that house there. There was a lot of digging. A lot of labor went into the foundation and stuff. I'll tell you, not only confidence, man, but God's help when we're building on his word. And you do it according to God's plan, you'll have no greater source of confidence. God says, I'm laying this stone in Zion. And if you would love the instruction of God, you love knowledge. Listen to Proverbs 12, 1. This is the New King James Version. Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. That's the Bible, not me. It says that. And I've hated correction sometimes. I had to get correction from my pastor a time or two. I thank God I have a pastor. And I want to tell you exactly how I felt during a couple of them times. I felt stupid because I was being stupid. That's why he had to speak to me. But the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But he who heeds counsel is wise. We need wisdom. The Apostle Paul tells us, you know, how the heart of a pastor, and he speaks to us of things like this, according to the grace of God that was given to me, he said, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and others building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds. That's 1 Corinthians 3.10. Uh, uh, 3, he said, this is the heart, and this is the heart of my, me as a pastor. I'm trying to help with the foundations for our lives, that we could build on it. We try to bring truth over the pulpit. That's our aim. We try to bring counsel through the word of God. 1 Timothy 3, 14, he is writing again. This is from the pen of the apostle Paul. I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I'm delayed... I write so you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. The pillar is a foundational piece. It holds structures together. So I thought it holds the roof up. Yeah, it connects, it holds. It's, it, it, you're in trouble when the pillar fails. Here again, the writer, the apostle, the great pastor of men, he's writing and saying, I'm writing these things so you know how to behave in the house of God. This place that is the pillar, man. It's the place that holds life together. 2 Timothy 2, 19, Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. So God says, it's, you know, it's going to cost us a little to build rightly. It's going to cost us saying no to certain things in the world. Amen? It's going to cost us. It's going to cost us humility. It's going to, you have to pay for this in some fashion, but it'll bring confidence. And I want to tell you that confidence in God will keep you through thick and thin, my friend. Proverbs 28, 1 says, the wicked flee even when no one pursues. People got ulterior motives and things in their heart that are not right. They, all of a sudden, they get an enemies list right in the house of God. My friends are not my friends. This person. All of a sudden, you know, everybody at work is out to get you. Life is out to get you. The world is out to you. It's amazing. When you let something in that doesn't belong, the Bible says the wicked flee, even though no one's pursuing. But the righteous are bold as lions. The message version again says, the wicked are edgy with guilt. They're ready to run off, even when no one's after them. But honest people can relax and be confident and bold as lions. The Bible says God wants us to build a good on this foundation and build in truth. And the last thing I want to speak to you about tonight is the scripture says you will dwell safely. In our text. You hold on to this stuff. Verse 23 says, then you will walk safely in your way. Your foot won't stumble. You, you, how many of you want to be able to make it through all of life? I'm looking at a pretty young crowd across the board. Sorry, I looked right at you, Art. I didn't mean that. <laughs> For the most part. 
A lot of young folks here, amen. I was young once too. I want to tell you, life hands you things that you don't expect many times. Amen. Sometimes you put your foot in it. You, you make the, you, you cause your own grief and problems and, you know, go away, condemn. But God's just looking for you to say, I'm sorry, help me. Come back. Have some wisdom. Turn to God and you will walk safely. Your foot won't stumble. You'll go through things. That footing's going to be rough, but you're not going to fall. and Stay down. You're going to know how to get up. I can't remember which boxer it was. Man, I wish I should. I should have wrote it down. I used to know it when I was younger. You forget some things. But one of the greats, man, one of the greats from back in the 50s, great, great boxer. One time he was being interviewed, and the interviewer said, you know, on the books, man, on the records, Ain't nobody been knocked down more than you in all the fight history. And he says, nobody ever got up more either. Got up and became one of the greats. You're not going to fall and stay down. You'll have safety in times of temptation, safety in times of weakness, safeties in times when you've troubled your own soul, safety against this world, it's tantalizing thing. Safety against the wiles of the devil and all he has to throw at you. Safety. God will see to it. So what do we need to do? Proverbs 4, verse 5 says, get wisdom and get understanding. With exclamation points. Get it. Do not forget. No, nope, turn away from the words of my mouth. God says, do not forsake her. She'll preserve you. Love her. She'll keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. The principal thing is the thing, folks. That's what that means. If you have this, you're going to be able to do that. You're going to be able to do this. You're going to be able to work your way through this. You're going to, when you get blindsided in life, you're going to be able to have light to see. In all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her. She'll promote you. She'll bring honor to you. When you embrace her, she'll place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory. She will deliver you. God's great gift of wisdom unlocks many things, guys. Several of these things that wisdom will kind of open up before you like a door are things that are so necessary to Christian existence, the will of God, keeping your life and your house together in the will of God, and finishing your course. Amen. Let's bow our heads tonight to pray. God will not withhold wisdom. The Bible said, even in the book of James, if you lack it, you know, he said, man, I, I just, uh, it's just me and I can't. No, 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 don't do that. You ask. If you lack wisdom, any man lacks, let him ask. Because God isn't going to smack you down and say, yep, that's right, you blew it. You're just stupid. God does not do that. He may slap you in a sense of discipline. Yes, correction. He may correct, and he does, because the Bible says he loves, he corrects those he loves, wants to help them. But wisdom will be yours if you can receive God's correction, if you can receive God's counsel, if you can believe and stand upon his word, if you're willing to dig down in life. And build on that solid word and that great foundation that God himself has laid. If you'll build on that, your house will stand and it'll be a house of blessing. Blessing. Peace in your house. You won't have to keep blaming the rest of the world. For all the troubles in your own home. You'll find a way to know grace and joy and peace. And God wants to help us with that. And I believe it with all my heart. That's why I'm preaching it. That wisdom of God is the principal thing. Maybe you lack that tonight and you say, maybe it's because I'm not where I should be with God. You know, I preach all over churches. I'll be preaching Midwest Conference this week before our conference. And I preach and I'll have people come up and, and, and ask me questions. Uh, I'll pull altar calls, uh, and it, maybe it's an altar call for salvation, and someone will talk to me after and say, I'm fighting this. I don't know about this. I, don't. I said, why did you not answer that altar call? Because what you need is to just simply give your life to Christ, repent of sin, 
and start over. And I have people ask me all the time, pray with me now. Pray now. I don't know why I didn't. I know what I need. You're right. I got to, I need Christ. Listen, our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You may be right there, right now, saying, what I need is to repent of my sin. The world's pulled you in a wrong direction. You know you're not living the life a godly man, a godly woman should live. You, you say tonight, I, I need Christ, and I want to change. I want Jesus to save me. I wish you, I want you to lift your hand. I pray you do. Lift it towards heaven and say, God, be merciful to me. He will. He'll save you. I'm asking you to acknowledge this by faith and lift a hand and say, I need Christ tonight. I need to make my peace with God. I need his grace. I need salvation. With a lifted hand, you'd say, I really want God to touch my life and make a change, changes I could never make on my own. Trust him with that and lift a hand towards heaven and say, this is my need. We'll, we'll pray for you tonight. I'm not going to send you up here before the world, but you can pray at this altar. God can make every bit the difference that you could never make. The blood of Jesus can cover every sin. The blood of Jesus. The power of God can raise us up from wherever you've been in life. Begin to put together a firm foundation in a good life, a good house. Anyone at all, backslidden or unsaved, says, I just need Christ tonight. Would you raise a hand towards heaven and say, that's my prayer. Is there anyone? Hallelujah. Christian, my brother, my sister, how we desperately need wisdom. And wisdom comes only when we can humble ourselves and receive it from God. It's a simple thing. That's why the Bible says, have ears that are quick to hear and not a mouth to speak out against it and correct it. And I, I like, there's a good sermon except. You know, that was this, pastor gave me this advice, but. I know what the Bible says, but. I can do this. And you know, the Bible says sometimes a wise thing to do is listen and respond to God when he's speaking to you. Let's open the altar for prayer tonight. Could you stand with me? If everybody would, we're going to take a moment to, uh, so is going to play this song for us, but you, you stand with us and the altar is open. Let me invite you to come and pray before the Lord tonight. Seek him out. Majestic is your name. My lips shall sing your praise, and my heart shall cry aloud. Come from above, and sing your my righteousness. You're my strength. You're my redeemer. If my lips shall sing your praise, I'll lift my hands to you. To bless your name, I surrender. You my life a sacrifice. Majestic is your name. Thank you, Lord, for the blood my lips shall sing your praise, and my the heart shall cry aloud and, and say, You're my righteousness, you're my strength, you're my redeemer. And my lips shall sing your praise, I lift my hands to you. To bless your name, I surrender. I mean my life a sacrifice of praise. You delivered me from darkness unto light. You've given my soul abundant light. 
Majestic is your name. My lips shall sing your praise, and my heart shall cry aloud and say, You're my righteousness, you're my strength, you're my redeemer. And my lips shall sing your praise, I lift my hands to you. To bless your name, I surrender. In my life a sacrifice of praise. Amen. I want to declare tonight that I've learned uh, many times in life, I've had many times I've had the experience in life where I wanted to do something about a situation where I could see as clear as a bell what I knew needed to be done, what I thought and what I felt like. But honestly, I've had multiple times where I chose to zip it up. And I, I've, I've had people say things as literal as, what, are you stupid? You don't do no, I'm just not going to say what I want to say. I'm not going to take this matter in, under my own brain my own power to solve is something I have to wait on God, allow God to move. I tell you, many of you know what I'm talking about. You've had to just allow God access, let him do something. That's, that's, you get to shovel out. That's when you're digging. <laughs> you're trying to go down to bedrock, man. Just work. Your faith is labor. It's trust. It's work. And I'll tell you, each, I've never been let down by God. Someone was asking me the other day, what do you do about a situation at work where an unfair thing, you know, this is a setup or something, you know, and I said, you trust God? Don't take that one in your own hands. You don't have to do that. Right will come out right. That's in the book of Dave, amen. <laughs> and it's truth. Right will come out right every time. God has a way of bringing justice, amen. And so wisdom is learning to hear learning to work, and learning to abide in faith. So uh, God bless you this evening. Amen. I believe we can do that. We can have a great life, man, every one of us, and find the will of God for your life. We have a great conference coming up. I'm really encouraging you to fast with us. I'll be fasting. I have to travel the Midwest and preach over there. At the, so I'll be, I was telling someone today, I said, I just realized I'm going to finish my jet lag and while I'm fasting and traveling and preaching again. Amen. So it's all right. Maybe I'll get a nap. Praise God in the middle of it. But uh, it's okay. I'm so glad for what's coming up. Who knows all the good things God will do in you and, and in the church and our churches as we have all of our multitude of our brethren come to town. So our Bible conference starts Monday night. And uh, Pastor Juan Cardo, 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 Cardo. Yes, he's always going to correct me on that one. Amen. My buddy Juan's coming, Juan Pablo. Hallelujah. And he'll be preaching and uh, you'll be blessed. He preached to us years ago. Some of you remember. He just came in for a Sunday. His sister used to live up in Raleigh. And so he was coming through on a visit on the way to Tucson or something. He stopped. And we were able to snag him for a couple services. And he's a, he's a joy to be around. He's a great minister. He'll start us off Monday night. He'll be preaching at our 630 service. Remember now, services are a little earlier every evening because it's conference week. And then Tuesday morning, we have a lineup. Did they put that up there? Uh, or Monday, wait a minute, go back to Monday. What's Monday say? <laughs> okay. Come Monday, you're going to find out what's happening. Hallelujah. Okay, then back to Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. There's a lineup on Tuesday, and then we have our brother ministering again on Wednesday and other men. So we start in the mornings early with prayer, and you can come and pray 8 o'clock. Well, some of you guys will be working, so the building will be open. You can come pray your usual time. But others, you know, anybody can come and pray with us at 8. Help us really pray in the presence of God. And that's why we're fasting tonight. Start at midnight. Get off the food for a few days. Come down to the church. We have the foyer open. Pastor King has a new uh, setup. You ask him. I don't know how it all works, but you're guaranteed you can get past the locked door. And if you're praying in the wee hours of the morning, it's nice to have the door locked these days. Amen. And just the brethren allowed in. And so... Uh, help us with that. Let's fast. Let's seek God. And then let, next week, man, we'll be firing it up with a, for a great, great conference. Praise the Lord. Let's go in God's grace. Amen. And, and God is going to help us greatly in the days to come right ahead of us here. 
Amen. Uh, Brother Aaron, why don't you dismiss us with a word of prayer? Amen.